We're going to the mountains today. We're going back to the mountains. This, we, uh, this month, we're looking at lessons we can learn from some of the mountains we find in Scripture. Mountains capture our attention. We're drawn to them. They just captivate our imagination because of how grand and, and high they are. And we looked last week at, at Mount Ararat and the events of Noah and how that mountain is a pivotal reminder of a God who is serious about sin and yet a God who is serious about trying the best that he can, giving the best that he can to save man. Today we're going to Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel exists on the northern part of Israel, not nearly as high as Mount Ararat. It stands only 1,700 feet above sea level. But don't let the fact that it's not as big lead you to thinking that what took place on this mountain is of any less significance. In fact, what took place on Mount Carmel may be one of the greatest demonstrations of the power of God that we have in the Bible. I want to give a little context as to what's going on when we find this mountain, at least a significant moment on this mountain. Fifty-eight some odd years have passed since the nation of Israel divided into two, into two kingdoms, the northern nation Israel, the southern Judah, And there came a series of seven kings. Each one was bad and rotten, but that seventh one was about as rotten to the bone as it gets. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 16, it says in verse 30 that Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. That's quite a reputation. That's quite a name. What made him so bad were several things. One was the fact of who he chose to marry. If there is a lesson about choosing your mate wisely, Ahab makes the point. And so he marries a woman named Jezebel. It's found in verse 31 of 1 Kings 16 when it says that that it came about that, that as it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. You notice the name of the father of this woman, Eth Baal. His name is entrenched in a false god. He marries a woman that came in a household entrenched in a false god. This woman was as bad as it gets. She didn't believe in God. She didn't care for God. In fact, if it were up to her, she would eradicate any evidence of God from the land. She only cared about herself. That's the woman who he chooses to marry. And then there's the fact that even on his own, he chose a path far from God. Because in the end of verse 31, it says that, that he went to serve Baal and he worshipped him. And so he erected an, an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. These are dark days. It, it seems as you read this section of history, the history of God's people, that any Pure devotion to Jehovah God all but vanished. Two calves were put in Dan and Bethel. An altar of Baal erected in Samaria. The prophets of God replaced with prophets of these false gods. And the people of God are wondering, where where is he? Where is our king? And that's when he comes on the scene. I mean, if, if, if there's someone who's going to come and stand up to the most wicked man and his wife and all his idols. It'd it have to be someone pretty great. And then he just blows in like, I don't know how Ricky would say it, but maybe something like, like a, a tumbleweed out of West Texas that came out of nowhere, out of the scene from the horizon. Like John Wayne on his horse. He blew in like a hurricane. You'll have to fix me with that, that language. He came in out of nowhere. You couldn't see him expected. No one knew where he came from. We don't know his story. All we know is that this man named Elijah has enough boldness and courage and confidence and faith in God to stand up even to King Ahab. Because in our context in 1 Kings 18, he comes right up to the king. And the king says in verse 17, when he sees him, he says, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? And he, Elijah, says, I've not troubled Israel, but you, you and your father's house have. Because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. He says, don't you dare shake a finger at me. I know what you've done. It's your fault. Look what you've done to the land. And then he does one of the most daring and bold ventures a prophet could do because he says, it's time for a showdown. Verse 19. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together with 400 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Prophet describes what's going to take place down 
and verse 22 when he says to the people, I alone am left as a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now then, let's, uh, now let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire underneath it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will put no, fi- no fire under it. Then when you call in the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, that's a good idea. The challenge is offered. You worship this God and you follow this God, Baal. I stand as a prophet of Jehovah God. Well, let's just put it to the test. Let's see which God is the God worth following there. And I think sometimes when we read this story and we go through this story, we, we falsely understand what this is really all about. This wasn't about standing up to Ahab. He really wasn't the king anyway. The king was really Jezebel, the wife. He didn't really have a spine. It wasn't about standing up to him. And it really wasn't about proving the false prophets wrong. I mean, they were entrenched in their belief in Baal. What this was all about was the people. About winning the hearts of the people of Israel back to the one true God. Because it says in 1 Kings 18, beginning verse 20, Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to to all the people and he said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. You notice that phrase there? Your version may say something a little bit different. The New American says, hesitating between two opinions. I like the ESV. It renders this idea of limping between the two options. I want to serve God, and I want to say I believe in God and I'm with God, but, you know, I also want to serve Baal and be pleasing to the king. They wanted to have the best of both, and Elijah says it's time to get off the fence, and you have to make a choice. Now, this is where it gets to us. We're learning lessons from the mountains. What are we supposed to learn from this, from Mount Carmel? And I think this verse right here shouts to us today that you cannot please God while living on the fence, and yet so often we try. That I want God, and I want to believe in God, and have God, and Jesus, and grace, and the cross, and all those wonderful things. But then I also really want the world as well. And so I'm here on Sunday. Sunday mornings, I'm here, and I worship, and I sing, and I take the Lord's Supper, and I give some money. Because I want God. I want that part of my life. But then I look, and I dress, and I think And I speak and I act just like the world Monday through Friday. I want it both. And you can't have both. Don't you know, James says, that those who try to befriend the world, that friendship with such a world is hostility towards God. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You cannot cannot have the very things that God finds displeasing. You cannot have sin in your life and believe that you're going to be, be pleasing to your God. You cannot have both. You cannot have both lives. You cannot have both lifestyles. You cannot have both opinions. It's kind of like trying to be married to two different people. It's kind of like fighting on both sides of a war. It's like trying to live in two different kingdoms at the same time. You have to make a choice. And the reality is, if we try and have both, I want God, but I also want the world. I want the popularity. I want the fun. I want the passion and the excitement. The reality is, trying to have both, you end up actually having none. Because if I want to be a Christian, a follower of God who has given my life to King Jesus, but I choose the path of the world, then I do not have the love of the Father. I have disavowed, I've turned my back on the very God who has commanded me to not love the world. But if I try to go to the world and turn to the world and find the pleasure and acceptance of the world while claiming any ounce of belief or commitment to King Jesus, the world, as Jesus says, will turn its back on us. Because if you were of the world, he says in verse 19 of John 15, the world would love you as its own, but because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You cannot have both. Do you know what this is really about? At some point in our life, we we have to make a choice. A deliberate, 
a complete, a fully committed choice. I am of God or I am not. I'm all in with King Jesus or I'm not. God put this before his people a long time ago. Exodus 3, 4, and verse 14, he says, For you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. He says, I don't want you to, to share your affection, your allegiance, your devotion, your worship to anyone else but me because I am a jealous God. And I think you and I who are married, we get that. We understand that. Because I made a promise to my spouse, to my wife, and we promised to love each other, to be intimate with one another and devoted to one another, to give to one another our life's heart and all. And yet if I started to give the very thing that defined our relationship, that promise, if I started showing that affection, that closeness, that romance, that intimacy towards anyone else, my wife would be jealous of the very thing I promised to only give to her and to her alone. A loved one preacher said in a wedding sermon, do not allow your eyes to wander, your minds to ponder, or your hearts to settle upon anyone or anything that will draw you away from each other. That's what God is saying. I don't want you to give your time, your affection, your life to anything but me. I want to be what means the most to you. Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord. That's my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Don't give it to them because I'm your Lord. I am your God. Now, here's where we are. I really don't think for the majority of us our struggle is between God and outright evil. I don't think as we wake up Monday morning, I believe that, that most of us are very sincere in wanting to seek the right path of following God. And so I don't believe for many of us our struggle is I'm waking up Monday morning and i got to choose either following God or just completely abandoning it in outright sin and evil. I don't think that's where we are. I think for the majority of us our struggle is an endless number of distractions that take our mind and our focus and our devotion away from where it really belongs. The things that keep us from God, putting God where he belongs in our life, and that's first. Things such as our focus, our mind. Because it's really easy to go a whole day long and not even think about God. Here it is. This may be self indicting It's possible to be in a place of worship, worshiping God, and not actually think at God at all while I'm here. And yet, Paul says, if you have been raised with Christ, there's never a time when you ever stop. You stop thinking. You stop setting. You stop focusing on he who is on the throne. You keep seeking the things above. You set your mind on things above. And yet, so often our mind gets anywhere, anywhere but where it needs to be above. For some of us, maybe it's income. One of the highest identifications of what means the most to me is where I effortlessly spend my money. I just swipe, I click. I don't even have to swipe anymore. That's an old illustration. I just pound it or I just click it and it's at my doorstep. Where is money flowing from me? Where does it go without a thought? Because Jesus says where your treasure is is a good indication of where it is that that means the most to you, where your heart is also. What about my relationships? The people that God has, has woven into my life, brought into my life, is it possible, as Jesus says, if you want to follow after me, then you have to be willing to put me before them. He uses the extreme language. You must be willing even to hate your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and, yes, even your own life. And so the people in my life, are they helping me to pursue God above all others or are they distracting me and keeping me from that one pure devotion? Maybe it's security. You know, it's amazing to me. And that one moment on the mountain message in Matthew 6 when Jesus says, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry if you're short, don't worry about your clothes, don't worry about your food. Did you ever notice how he ended that? Because I would imagine if someone got up here and preached the way he did and ended on that, we'd say, well, that's kind of insensitive. Because he says, I don't want you to worry about those things. I don't want you to worry about your clothes. We are going to get your next meal. I don't want you to worry about all the cares under the sun. What I do want you to worry about is the kingdom of God. I want you to seek it first. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
And all the rest of these things are going to take care of themselves. Just make sure you get your priorities set, your order in order, and don't get your eyes off the kingdom. We worry so much, but maybe we're not worried about the right things. And then, of course, there's just time. Every day, every week, every schedule, where, where does God exist within my time? Can, can you see perhaps a, a message that is shouting from 1 Kings 18 to a distracted people? God comes first. God comes first. You cannot share God with any other. You cannot share God with your work. You cannot share God with your passions. You cannot share God with your wealth. God is God and he must come first. But maybe that's the other point that we can say here is that if there is one true God, one true and living God who is watching and listening everything we are doing today, then the message of Elijah from 1 Kings chapter 18 is follow him. If the Lord is God, follow him. What I love about this scene in 1 Kings 18 is that when Elijah conjured up this test between the prophets of Baal and then he as his lone prophet, he gave them every opportunity to completely crush him. The odds were completely in their favor. He chose a test that Baal should be able to win in an instant because he was the sun god, a fire god. He didn't say, let's create a pool of water. Let's have our God sprout up a tree, breathe out life from the dust. He says, the test is light of fire. Your God is the God of fire. Well, he should do that pretty easy. The odds were against him. You have one man praying to Jehovah God. You have 450 prayers going up to this God. And then there's the fact he said, you go first. Right? If he had gone first, well, that's not really fair. You didn't give us a chance. He didn't give us a chance to prove ourselves. He didn't give us a chance to show it. You go first. And then he gives them the chance to go all day long. And so, all right, I'm starting a timer. Ten minutes. If your God doesn't do it, it's my turn. One hour. In fact, if you follow the context, they start at morning. And it starts with praying as the day begins. And they pray. And they pray. And they pray. And then that prayer turns to pleading by noon. And then after noon, it gets to the afternoon, and it turns into begging. And then when it finally gets to the evening, at the end of the day, they are outright screaming for their God, cutting themselves to hear him. And the irony is, as Israel was limping between two options, now the prophets of Baal are limping around the altar, trying to get this God's attention. And all the while, Elijah hits him where it hurts because he asks questions like, maybe your God is deep in thought. Maybe he's just thinking about something, which means he's obviously not thinking about you. Maybe, maybe your God is busy, which means he can't handle more than one load. He can't do everything. Maybe he's really busy and you're just too much for him right now. He'll come back to you when he's got some more time. Maybe your God was traveling. He's on vacation. He can't be here right now, which means he can't be everywhere at all time, which means he can't be here for you right now. Or maybe he was just sleepy. Maybe your God's tired. He needs a nap, which means your God is about as useless as the men trying to call upon him. Can you see what Elijah's doing here? Can, can, can you catch right here for a minute and see what Elijah's doing here? Do you know what's really appealing about making God in our image and worshiping a God that I want? As that I never have to change. A God in my image never thinks that I'm wrong. A God in my image has no expectations. A God in my image likes everything that I like and will always be on my side to approve everything that I want. But you know what the problem is? When I am in genuine need, that God will never show up. When I'm in desperation, that God won't answer my prayers. And when I'm lost, that God won't rescue me. So ask yourself today, I don't know. I don't know what's wrestling what you have wrestled or maybe you are wrestling. Is there any amount of money? Is there a title at work? Is there a passion or a pleasure so great, a relationship so enthralling? 
as her amount of, of equity so, so securing? Is there a strength or an intellect or a place in your own life that you can arrive to where you could say, I need not God anymore in my life? Which one of us could have enough money, enough job, enough people in our life to be completely satisfied from here to eternity? Which one of us could have enough money to be completely safe from here to eternity? Which one of us could have enough things under the sun to save our soul? And that's the whole point. There is no Savior, no God but our God. Isaiah says, consult together, argue your case, get together and decide what to say. Who made these things known so long ago? What idol ever told you that it would happen? Was it not I, the Lord? For there's no other God but me. A righteous God and Savior. There is none but me. Can you hear your God whisper that to you today? There is no God in your life. There is no one who will hear your prayers. There is no one who will rescue you from your darkness. But me. But me. Elijah seemed alone. 450 against one is not great odds. But the reality is, when it's 450 against one plus God... God always wins. I want you to notice when Elijah finally takes his turn. In verse 30, Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been tore down. Elijah took 12 stones, verse 31, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, had come, and he said, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. He arranged the wood, and he cut the ox in pieces, and he laid it on the wood. He said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And then he said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time. And the water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Do you see what he's doing? And one step, he is showing what it is he's trying to do through the Lord, what God is doing through him. I am rebuilding what has been broken. I'm putting back as one what you had torn down. That ancient path, that sacred family, that nation bought and purchased by God, I have not forgotten. I will rebuild. And then he makes it to where this cannot be a trick. It can't be a slide of the hand. He drenches it in water and again and again so much water that there's excess filling it around it. Now, I don't know about you. If you've ever tried to light something that's been wet, it just doesn't happen. Jason, it doesn't happen. Doesn't matter how many butane torches you have. If you've got soaking wood, it's not going to catch on fire. And so what Elijah is saying is, if this is going to catch on fire, I can't do it. You can't do it. Only a holy God can do it. And so he stands and he prays. And in a simple prayer to his God, he says, O Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I cannot think of a more relevant 
and powerful and vivid reminder for a drifting and distracted people today to be called back to a moment when God showed forever He is God. No God but me. Behold our God seated on His throne. Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. You may be thinking, well, if I had a front row seat on Mount Carmel, if I felt the heat from the fire that fell, then I would feel the same way. I would feel the same way. I would feel the power and the all and the impressiveness of such a sight. And yet, brethren, we have something of a far greater magnitude than the fire that fell on that mountain. You ate it and you drank it. Paul says that there is nothing that comes before it. The thing that comes first, the first reality, the first truth above all others is the fact that Jesus died for our sins in accordance to the scripture and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. Behold our God. You know what Mount Carmel reminds us? At least what it ought to remind us today is we're going to exit this door, exit these doors, and step out into 2022 as followers of Christ. The mountain message reminds us of this. We have but one God. We have only one Lord. And his place is first place in our life. Nothing comes before him. Hear that again. Nothing comes before him. Nothing. No person. No interest. No power. No political movement. No worldly pursuit. No grand endeavor that we could conceive. Nothing comes before him. He is first. Now, what can we do? We're going to walk it off the page right here, ending right here. How do we put Jesus where he belongs in our life first? None before him. Well, maybe it would start right here, and this could help us this week, that every day we give him the first minutes. The first minutes every day. Imagine that. Imagine if we started our day and before we grabbed our phone and we got on Facebook and we were flipping through the things that we slept through the night or we looked at the news and were reminded of all the things that we have to complain about. What if we started the day thinking with God, talking with God? You may be saying, Jordan, I'm really not a morning person. I'm not coherent in the morning. It takes every act of of God, four coffees and five bangs to get me moving in the morning. I've got that. I understand it. But even though you're drowsy and even though you're tired, I will tell you there is something profound about beginning the morning with nothing but a thought with God. Even the simple prayer, Lord, you gave me another day. And may the fact I begin this day with you help me in every endeavor to put you first. Begin every day with God. So give God the first minutes of every day. What if we gave God the first day of every week? Sunday, this day. This day is really important. It's more than the first day of the week, and it's more than it's just Sunday. Revelation 1 verse 10 says this is the Lord's day. It's his day. It's a day of worship. It's a day we're together. It's a day that we, we, we learn. We have to tell ourselves. We have to show our families. We need to show this family nothing comes before it. Hear this. Let's make it abundantly clear. No soccer tournament, football tournament, softball tournament comes before it. No work project, no traveling endeavor comes before it. This comes before First, and you don't have to tell it to me. You need to tell it to the God whose day is named after it. It is his day, his day. In fact, maybe there's some greater questions today that ought to be asked. We've got some folks who are tuning in at home, and I ask you to ask yourself. I cannot answer it for you. For those of you who are streaming at home and not assembled with us today, 
Is it because you cannot? If that's the case, we are praying for you and anxious for your return. Or is it because you won't and are unable? Not because of ability, but because of will. Our brother Kelly said it so well this morning. If we have a great segment here of this church family, of this church family, and I just, I want to plead with you, plead with you out of kindness, but I want to say it boldly. Our shepherds have provided for us an amazing opportunity for us to learn and to grow together, and that begins at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings, and it carries us through this day where we, we have sermons, and we have worship, and we have Bible classes, and yet we have a segment of our church family who doesn't come until the very end of the morning, and I would ask you, is it because you can't or simply because you won't? Can I give God the first day of the week? And if I can't give him this, if I can't give God the first day, if I can't give God three hours on a Sunday, what indication will there be that when I'm really pressed in a situation where there is not God's influence and I'm at work and I have to choose him over the world, what indication would there be that I will choose him then? Can I show God, can I indicate to God that he comes first by being here, even as a bare minimum of what it is he calls us to do and to be? Can I be here? And then maybe even the hardest one is giving God the first of our money. That hurts because we say it's mine. And I earned it. And I worked for it. And I got a lot of things it's got to go towards. But I'll tell you, if before you start parceling out every paycheck and you send it to where it goes with its bills and its places it ought to be, if you take a time every time that check comes in, maybe you don't get the check anymore. I know it's a direct deposit. But before that money is spent and it goes to its places, if you were to at least think about God and the work of God and the kingdom work. God said so long ago to a people who were told to take their first crops before they could eat them, the first, the best of the crops, and to give it to their God. He said the reason for this was to teach them to put him first in their lives. And no, we don't have crops to give to God. We have lives. But those lives are blessed with blessings, and we show God his place in our lives when we are willing to give of our blessings to him. In your kingdom and in your service, how can you use what you have given to me for your good? For your good. These are the days of Elijah. Declaring the word of the Lord. I'm going to lay this in your laps today. This message is so powerfully relevant because we are a people far too often who sit on the fence and want a little bit of both. We want some of God, but we want some of some other things too. And the prayer of Elijah was, answer me, Lord. Answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and you are turning their hearts back again. And I believe today can be one of those days, one of those heart-turning days. Maybe if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we've allowed too much into our lives to keep us from putting God where he belongs, first and foremost, first in our hearts, first in our devotion, and it's time to make a turn and a change. Maybe we've allowed some things to distract us from day by day, giving our time and our thought and our devotion and our worship to God, and it's time for a change. There's no God but our God. And today we've taken a step closer and closer to meeting him in person. And so I ask you, how long will it be, wherever you stand, until you are resolved to make a serious change in your life and to rise to the calling God has for you and to be the people he has called for you to be? I'm resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. The things that are higher and nobler, these have allured my sights. I will hasten to him. 
Jesus, I come to you. I ask you today, if you're not right with your God, if you need help, if you need prayers, if you need today to be a day of changing and you need some help in that, we can help you right here, right here today. You have one God, you have one Savior. Put him first in your life.